Praise the Lord. It's the day before Easter and therefore the day after Passover. We are still in the season where the sacrifice of Jesus is celebrated. And this is Easter of 2022. My name is still Eliaza. This is still the platform of Verbatim Christian Network. On our daily broadcast on the State of the Union, and that between Jesus and his bride, the church. And the word is still, tell my people to return to me, so that from this platform, a call is going out to God's people to return to him. And so since we started, we have been looking at different areas of possibility where we might have turned from him, which may have occasioned his request that we return. Now, you might be saying you are innocent of these things, perhaps. But wisdom demands that having heard such a thing, tell my people to return to me. That you examine your ways and your circumstance. Perhaps you might find a reason to return to God in whatever area or dimension or focus of life. Some of us need to return to our earlier place of consecration. Some of us need to return to our original place in the love of Christ, which the book of Revelation refers to having fallen away from your, the place of your first love. It says, remember your first love. Hmm. And so in the last couple of days, we have been looking at the business of why Jesus came. What necessitated the coming of Jesus and how it pertains to the business of tell my people to return to me. If we are celebrating, commemorating the sacrifice of Jesus, then we must understand exactly what that sacrifice was supposed to achieve. So yesterday we looked in detail at why Jesus came. Not the matter of his dying on the cross. His dying on the cross was supposed to achieve something. His dying on the cross was pursuant to a purpose, which is, still is, to restore us to God the Father. To take us back to God. God came, uh, Jesus came in the revelation of the Father. And if you look, you will see that all over the four gospel books, as they are so called, he never stopped talking about the Father. He never stopped talking about his Father in heaven. Because that was his focus, that was his purpose, to reveal the Father to us. And then ultimately to reveal the Father to us in himself. Today haven't looked at why he came yesterday which is not to die for sin as it were but through dying for sin to restore us to the father we have already said why did the restoration become necessary in other words in restoring us to the father what is the hope? What does the Father hope to restore in bringing us back to Him? But put very simply, what did we lose? Which Jesus came to restore. What did we lose to sin? Yes, we know that sin is the problem. It's recorded in the Bible. Man's disobedience to God resulted in several things. 
such that the coming of Jesus, as stated in the scriptures, that he came to reconcile us to the Father. What were the things in the Father that we lost? Then, hopefully tomorrow, Easter itself, the celebration of the resurrection, and therefore the life, we will see how much of a success the death of Jesus was, became, has been, or will be. But that will be tomorrow, hopefully. Today, we want to confine ourselves to an examination of those possible things which we lost as a result of sin. But to understand the business in particular, we must revisit the matter of the relationship between God and man as it was at the beginning. I always like to put this forth. It's called the principle of the first mention. Every time you want to understand a concept in God, go to the place in scripture where something of that concept is first mentioned. Generally about that place, you will see God's mind, expectation, and all these things about that thing. So if we must understand something, we must necessarily go to the things that went into the production of the thing. So if we are looking for faults or areas of improvement, so we understand how the thing came about. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible tells us that God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let him have the dominion. Now watch the wording of those words. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let him have dominion. Dominion must be something about God. Because if he is going to make man in his image and in his likeness, and then he asks, let him have dominion. It must mean that having made him in his image and in his likeness, man would not be complete to function in the capacity of God on earth without the aspect of the dominion. In other words, in creating man, God simply made himself visible in man. So today we would say, so if anybody is looking for God, just look at man. But today the reality is, if anybody is looking for God, look at Jesus. But then there is no Jesus today. He's in heaven. What he has left behind is the church. So he says, tell my people to return to me. Why? We are God's ambassadors. We are God's embassy. Somebody looking for God ought to be looking at the church. So in John chapter 12 or thereabouts, we are told of certain men who came and they said to the disciples, we will see Jesus. And Philip and Code took those men to, the, to Jesus. That there are some people who want to see you. And if I may paraphrase the situation, Jesus must have shook his head and said, oh God. You are still bringing people to me because they want to see me. What happened to you, my disciples? I should be reproducible in you. And so he said, on that occasion that it was time for the son of man to go his way that was when he made the declaration for if the if the if the corn of wheat does not fall to the ground it abides alone but if it falls to the ground and dies now it can bear forth much fruit those fruit being us now christ uh, 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 christians in other words if you still have to bring people physically to see me, then it is time for me to go so that that which is necessary to reproduce myself can happen in his death and therefore resurrection. So the plan was that through Christ and the rest of us, mankind is supposed to be able to see God. Jesus came in the revelation of God the Father. What do you think the church is about? If the church is the body, 
that which may be known of Christ. The body. If the church is the body of Christ, that which may be seen. And Christ is the body, the image of God, that which may be seen of God. Then in the church, Christ should be seen, and therefore God should be seen. This is the reality. So when God say, let us make ma said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let him have the dominion, essentially, God was about to create something of himself that was to dwell in the earth. And to complete the process, in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, he gives, he said, the Bible says he breathes into man, which is he put the life of God into man. He breathed into that which he had just formed from the dust of the earth. He breathed into it the spirit. And the Bible says at that moment, man became a living soul. What was, what was man then before God breathed into man? A dead soul, of course. So, God says, man should not eat from, you know, we know the story. And we know the story. Man failed. Man ate of the fruit. Man therefore sinned. Man therefore disobeyed God. And God had said that the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that day you shall die. And so, man ate and man died. But in practical, functional reality, what did man lose that day when he disobeyed God? Yes, ultimately, man died. But what are the things that made up for the life which now became non-existent, which we now refer to as that man died? So God cannot behold sin, the Bible says. So the moment man sinned, God turned his face. Because he can't behold sin. And in turning his face, just like he's saying to us now, tell my people to return to me. In turning his face away, he left man. That is, number one, man lost the God factor in his life. So please understand that when you turn away from God, you understand what you are losing, for which he is saying, tell my people to return. When you turn from God, you lose the God factor. Not that he has left you, but you lose the fact of him. So the moment man sinned, God turned his face, man lost the God factor in his life. Man lost the life of God, the Spirit, that which he breathed into man originally left. And so man became what he was before God breathed into man in Genesis chapter 2. Man became dust to dust, ashes to ashes. That's why in Genesis chapter 3, God says, dust you are and dust you will return to. At that point, his spirit had left. Man was never dust. Man was created spirit. But in Genesis chapter 3, God says, dust you are. Because at that point, the spirit of God had left. Man was now left with a substitute life. A life at the realm of the soul. A life at the realm of the flesh. This is what we call death. Spiritual death, if you like a separation from God. So man lost the life of God. Man lost his place with God. We'll come to that in a minute. Man became separated from God. In this separation, we lost our God-likeness. We lost the nature of God and took on a new nature, the nature of sin. And therefore acquired what the, what the Bible in Romans chapter 6 calls the body of sin. In losing the God factor, in losing the life of God, man returned to dust you are. 
And that's why you hear them say, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Because the spirit is not there. And the spirit not being there, like I have said already, meant now that man had become separated from God. But critically, Romans chapter 8 verse 11 tells us that if the spirit that raised up Jesus dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus shall by that same spirit quicken your mortal body. In other words, in Adam at the beginning, at least at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, up to Genesis chapter 3, when they sinned, between Genesis 2 and 3, man had the spirit, the life of God, in the carcass made from the dust of the earth. In perhaps those one and a half chapters of the Bible, God had what Genesis, um, Romans chapter 8 verse 11 is talking about. If the spirit that raised up Jesus dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus shall by that same spirit quicken, that is give life, vitality, refreshing, invigoration to your mortal body. The moment man lost the spirit or the life or the presence or the input of God as a result of sin, man became mortal. Man became mortal. Man was created immortal. Spirit! The moment man lost the spirit connection with the life of God, as it were, man became mortal. What does mortal mean? Weak, sick able, diable mortal. So when you hear them say that he dealt the man a mortal blow, it means the blow was fatal. The kind of blow that can produce death. Immortal means he cannot die. Therefore mortal is that which can die. So the moment man lost the spirit connection, man became mortal. It was now possible for man to die a physical type of death. And if you study carefully, you will see that Adam continued. Adam lived on to be about 900 or something years before he finally died. So man lost his place with God. Man lost the effect, the advantage of the presence of God. I can't begin to talk about the presence of God and hope to achieve anything meaningful in 20 short minutes. Man lost the presence of God. Let me try just a few. The Bible says that in the presence of God there's fullness of joy. The Bible says that in the presence of God there's pleasures forevermore. The Bible talks about riches on the one hand, glory and honor on the other hand, in the presence of God. The Bible talks about Dagon, the Philistine God, falling and falling face down in the presence of God. Man lost the manifest presence of God, not just the abiding presence. Man lost the manifest presence. The presence of God that quickens his body is a function of the manifest presence. Man lost the manifest presence. The presence of God in Jesus which made demons to cry out. Man lost the presence of God. Man lost the life of God. Man lost the spirit connection with God. Man became separated from God. Man lost his God-likeness and now took on the sin nature. This God-likeness will be a reference to the righteousness of God. Man became dust instead of spirit, which he originally was created as. Now, in losing the spirit connection, God being spirit, remember? John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit. In losing the spirit connection, man lost 
the ability to connect with heaven, so to say. We cannot reach heaven and we cannot receive from heaven. Because as it were, as we will say today, the information superhighway between man and heaven had been truncated, lost. Because that information highway is constituted in the person of the spirit. So from that moment, prayer from man became nonsense in the ears of God. It became abomination. We had become estranged from God. We had become strangers. We had become strangers. What was originally designed to be our habitation, we lost. So what happens when you take something, a living thing, out of its natural habitat? What happens? Have you seen a fish flip and flop for a, a few minutes or seconds after it has been taken out of water? And then it dies. Because it cannot survive outside water. Man was created spirit. Man was created for the spirit. Man was created in the spirit. Man was created to be spirit. Man was created to function in spirit. The moment we lost the connection, there was only one thing that was going to happen. Dust to dust. We became mortal. We became mortal. Now, according to Romans, 8.16 The spirit constitutes refreshing and refreshment. The spirit constitutes the, the, the source, the possibility of invigoration. The spirit constitutes vitality to the mortal body that man became. That's why it says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So the spirit is able to give life to a dead body. The spirit is able to give life to deadness. So you would have heard a preacher or the other say that by the spirit of God, every dead circumstance in your life rise up. Whether it be a dead womb or a dead brain or dead ears or dead eyes, anything dead, the Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus shall quicken, give life to, give invigoration to, give vitality to, refresh that which was previously dead. What did man lose as a result of sin? We lost that capacity of the spirit. So we became mortal. We became diable. This is why in Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and even 10, talking about the priesthood, he says that it was necessary to change the old order of the priesthood to the new order of priesthood in Christ. Because the old order had an automatic limitation in that the priests had a weakness, had an infirmity, because they were mortal. He said, but Jesus coming in the power of an endless life is now able to save to the uttermost those who are saved by him. Why? Because in him is life without end. The priests could not guarantee that because they could not continue in their ministry because they were limited to and limited by death. This is what we lost. Since morning, I find that a certain phrase, I, I don't know what to call it, has been repeating itself in my head. Somebody made uh, mention of it, I think, yesterday. Duty, continuity, announcer. I remember back in the day, the television station that we grew up with in Nigeria, NTA, I would hear somebody announce, my name is such and such and such, I am the duty, continuity, announcer. 
the presence of the Spirit guaranteed continuity. The absence of the Spirit automatically brought limitation by the fact of an infirmity in the flesh. Death. This is what we lost. We lost the capacity to live forever by the Spirit, that is. So with the Spirit there, the body that was constructed that day in Genesis chapter 2 had no business with death. That was not God's original plan. So Jesus dying on the cross and now being raised by this same Spirit we're talking about confirmed and proved that death had now been conquered. So every person in Christ now, with the spirit returned, with the life connection returned with God, the quickening that is guaranteed by the spirit is restored. That's why Jesus, for example, said that there be some standing here who will not taste death before I return. And we still haven't understood it because yes, all of them have died, of course. Every person who possibly was in front of Jesus when he made that statement that day, of course have died. So what was he referring to? That the life of man was not supposed to be described or, or, or was not supposed to be described in the carcass of his flesh. It was supposed to be described in the spirit. So indeed there be many standing here who will not taste death until Jesus comes. Why? Because of life eternal that we receive by Christ. This is what we lost. But tomorrow we will talk about what we received, what was restored. Now, because of the loss of the spirit, the reinvigorating or refreshing or quickening of vitality giving capacity of the spirit, because of the loss of that capacity in the spirit, there was a resulting infirmity or weakness in man. This is alluded to in Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27. And then again, Romans chapter 6 verse 6, when it talks about the body of sin. In Romans 6, 6, it goes on to say that having been baptized into the death of Jesus, we have been baptized we have been baptized into death with him, therefore destroying this body of death. The nature of death which we received by way of progeny, by way of ancestry from Adam, has been dealt with. But that's for tomorrow. But that's what we received. A mortal body, a diable body, a weakness in the body which automatically meant that that body could perish. And haven't lost the you see all these things are tied to the life of the spirit and the life of the spirit is the life of god the father so in saying that god jesus came that we may be restored to the father he is saying that jesus came that we may be restored to the life of the father and this restoration to the life of the father is by the spirit so if you read the epistles you will see a constant reference to living by the spirit why that's our original and true life not the one that is described by the senses or described by sight of this physical body. But we lost the understanding of that life and so we have essentially lived a soulish life. A life based on the senses ever since. Such that today the senses war against the spirit According to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. It says that if you by the Spirit put down the desires of the flesh, you will live. For the flesh and the Spirit do war against each other, so you cannot do what you want to do. There is a war going on. The war is happening because we have grown up, we have gotten used to, in this life, we have gotten used to being led by sight, being led by the senses being led by the appetites of the flesh. But now the spirit has been restored. 
Now we have to consciously put down the desires of the flesh. But that's the battle of Christianity. That's our daily cross. Something we must bear until Jesus comes. Yes, upon maturity, we, we win more and more and more of these battles. Now, having lost the life of the Spirit, remember Genesis 1.26, when God created man, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let him have the dominion. The man that was created in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 was spirit. Because God is spirit. The image of God we have to be spirit. Until it is given flesh, just as Jesus was given flesh. So that he could be a man in this earth. So the man that was originally created with God said, let him have dominion over spirit. Therefore, dominion is of the spirit. When we lost the spirit, we lost dominion. We lost our authority in the earth. And having lost our authority, having lost our dominion, which we're supposed to have over the earth, air, land, and sea, having lost that dominion, we became slaves. We lost our freedom. We became servants of sin. We entered into bondage, having lost our freedom. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Liberty. The moment we lost the Spirit of the Lord, we lost our liberty. We lost our freedom. We became slaves. We came under bondage to sin and the effects thereof. Now, if you have your dominion, the dominion that is of the Spirit, that is, you would speak and it would come to pass because of the dominion. The reason you speak and it doesn't come to pass is because you are not functioning in the capacity of dominion. You are not functioning in the dimension of the spirit called dominion. Why do I say that? When a king speaks from his throne, or in fact wherever he is, because wherever the king is, there his throne is, actually. So the one who is king or the one who sits on the throne, when he speaks, the authority of that throne automatically follows his word. Now the Bible says that we are seated in Christ upon the throne of God. So our dominion, by that very fact, is restored in Christ. But until we know such things, we will speak and nothing will happen. Where the word of the king is, there is what? Power. You can switch those words around. Where the power of the king is, there's what? The word of the king. Everywhere you see power displayed, somebody spoke. Having lost the life of the spirit, we lost our dominion, and therefore our words fell to the ground when we spoke. We became servants. And then lastly, because I know that my time is up, I know I've already overshot my time by about five or so minutes. And lastly, and this list is by no way all-encompassing. It is by no way exhaustive. But for the sake of this broadcast, lastly, I just wrote down 10 things that we lost. Lastly, the confidence of being able to access the presence and receive help or input from the from God. We lost the confidence of being able to access his presence and receive help or input. So you will see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, it says that because we now have a high priest who is seated high above in the heavens in Christ, he said, Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence. It is, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence to receive help. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Have we lost the spirit connection? We lost access. We lost access to the presence of God. We lost access to the throne. And so we began to flounder. 
like lost sheep. We began to live according to our wits. We began to live according to how we saw fit. No longer were we subject to the spirit because we didn't even grow up knowing the spirit. We became subject to the flesh and its desires. That's why the Bible keeps saying, put down the lusts of the flesh. Put down the lusts of the flesh. That if you put on Christ, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. The flesh has ruled all this time. But by the resurrection of Christ, the life of God is guaranteed once again. And now by the Spirit, we can put down the reign of the flesh. But we will do that tomorrow. We will look into such things tomorrow. But for now, I have gone into enumerating, elucidating, highlighting all these things. So that when we say, God says, tell my people to return to him, we will understand what he is asking us to return to. Move away from the position of lost to the position of found, to the position of restoration. So that we begin to walk once again the way we were originally designed to function. I'll be with you again same time tomorrow. Until then, this is the State of the Union signing out. See you tomorrow.